This video contains information that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are a viewer and are triggered or shocked by images and need a warning prior to every clip or story being discussed, then please unsubscribe from my channel immediately. My channel covers the harsh reality of even the worst crimes imaginable and is for adults only. For those of you who fit into this category, take this message as your warning and don't watch any further. I think you guys can hear me, right? The music didn't play, though. There we go. Oh, God. All right. Woo, man. Hey, where's Trace Elements? She was supposed to send me the rap. Yeah, well, if you got your um, T-shirt like this one right here, we are freaks. You know, make sure you send in a picture. To my email. Hey, look at that. Sarah McConnell, man. I haven't seen you in a million years. That's yeah, Carrie Boyer up there. One eyed Carrie Boyer. The super fan. Yeah, I've already put the last live on private. I'll have to go through it. Weed, weed through that one. Just in case you happen to be watching it and it just quit working. Hey, look at that. It's Crystal, a.k.a. Beaver Gaming Sub Sub Crystal. The longest name in YouTube history. Yeah, well, there, that's Lori. If, for those of you who haven't seen this background before, that's Lori Daybell with a little orange tint walking by. And she's on her cell phone just hearing the news that she got a million-dollar life insurance policy. And as you can see right there, she's very excited about it, dancing and dancing and dancing, Lori Vallow there. Um, but then the news comes out that she uh, didn't get a nickel. <laughs> she actually hears about it, that uh, Charles is smart enough to take her off the life insurance policy. And upon hearing that news, she walks back into the bar and basically, I think, falls flat on her face. But we'll see that here shortly. Oh, there she goes. Okay. Poor Lori Daybell. Or is it Lori Vallow? We just don't know. I think it was more... Yeah, there she goes. Okay. Hey, Cairo, you missed our the last controversial show. That's right, it's Dumbbell. Well, the mug said Dumbbell, right there. See, that mug that... Uh, Carrie's got there is it's probably my best mug that I ever made other than the freak mug that's over here the freak heart one's probably the best one but in terms of non I mean I'm not even sure what you'd say non-standard mug <laughs> more people bought that one <laughs> hey, Kit Kat. Kit Kat's always nice. On uh, even on the sl on the slowest nights ever, she'll come in and go, "Hey, everybody." <laughs> yeah. I mean, who doesn't like Kit Kat? Oh, well, don't answer. But, um, 
Is it too early for a donation wave person <laughs> surfing female sign? Maybe a little early. I just did another show just before this. It was a shorter one, but uh, anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, no wait, what was? Oh yeah, by the way, hey Cairo, I just had for dinner a stuffed mushroom, and for a moment I thought, hey, look at this, but then I realized I think there's probably meat in it, but man, that was some good stuff. One of those big portobello mushrooms with it. Well, thanks, Patricia M. I know that probably doesn't count, but... <laughs> Donation wave. Come it was really here. good. I couldn't believe it. Hey. Wow, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, I don't really eat stuffed mushrooms too much, but it's pretty good. Can you people change the background? What does that mean? Whiner. What does that mean, whiner? I don't get what that means. Thanks, Miss Skiss and Sarita Hilly and Chrissy Paradis. Patricia M and Kit Kat. Can you guys change the background? I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We, that's coming up two days. I guess it'll be uh, Sunday night is our big donation night. We all love Kit Kat and Grey growing heart, growing heart. Yeah. I'm actually thinking of donating a couple hundred dollars to a different, another one too. Just as part of it. Little Wave. Hmm. Well, I, you've had you your whole life. You haven't been a vegetarian, Cairo. Come on, right? There must have been a decision, a time where you decided. What is Weiner? What's your problem, Weiner? You don't like my background, Weiner? What's wrong with it, Weiner? Yeah. I have other backgrounds too, but why can't I have this one, Weiner? Wave. Yeah, I know what it is, but I'm calling you Weiner because that's what you're doing. I know what, what you want me to call it, but I look at you as a Weiner because you're complaining about the background. See, I'm smarter than you are. That's the thing is I was able to take your name and turn it into what I wanted to say. Okay, that, that's where the wave, difference is. Wave, waving hand. Yeah. You should have been able to sort of figure that out just by the way I was saying it. Dun. <laughs> Avalon Apples and Cherry and Sarah Brown and Carolina T. Thank you. Please wow. no whiners. And there's J. Case. David Myers. Wow, you guys are amazing. What's going on? What happened? Did... did did Kit Kat start this all again? She's like a little instigator there. Oh, there it goes. I was reading the chat and forgot. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, Cairo. There's no doubt that I'll be in prison pretty soon. H U Z E and the Freaks performing live on stage tonight. Be there to hear Gray's freestyle. Rap. Oh my god. I'm not really a good at freestyling, I'll tell you that. I, I don't have the whole library memorized like the guy, the Australian serial killer guy. Effin this and if and that. I can't rap, so I say effin this and if and that. His eventual imprisonment. Hey, Weiner, why, why do you care though with the background? It's like nobody cares what your opinion is on the backdrop. You, you understand that? As a matter of fact, I'm going to leave this up for seven years straight now because you said that. I'll just change maybe the animation. Well, you don't have to hide her 
uh, Wally. <laughs> yeah, oh, there you go. I'm just saying. You don't even have to remove her comments. They're just stupid. Um, okay, so anyways, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch to... We're going to do a, a case here. And thanks, David Meyer, Charlene S., and Cairo. J. Case. I think you guys need to send in your wraps, because I think Trace Elements was going to send hers in. But uh, she never sent me the email. Let's see, where is it? No, nope, I don't see it. Hold on. I don't know where she went. She didn't send it in. FN, this Thanks, is Zoza. FN that. <laughs> FN, I can't rap, so I say FN this and FN that. Hey, thanks, Rachel. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch screens here. I'm going to go over the article here on Michael Gray and Shirley Gray first. The only part they don't like is they have that last name that they've got. All right, there's a lot more that I don't like too. Are you serious, Gray? That's all you could find? Thanks, Julie J. Okay, so uh, they, they actually found another body in this case that like we were saying, I guess a six-year-old boy and that body was found in the backyard of the house they lived in prior. It's crazy, right? Hey, thanks, Curious Georgia. Oh shit, what happened? Yeah, so let me, I'll just play this uh, video here, and then we'll take a look at it. New documents from Knox County reveal a search at a Hall's home uncovered the remains of a boy. It is the second dead child now linked to a Roan County couple charged with years of child abuse. The Knox County Sheriff's Office searched this home on Cedar Breeze Road yesterday. On Monday, investigators say they found the remains of a girl buried in the yard of a home in the 10 mile community in Roan County. Documents say both children died years ago and were in the custody of Michael Gray Sr. and Shirley Gray. We do want to warn you, the details of this case are difficult and hard to hear. 10 News reporter Cole Sullivan hey, joins look, us they give a They give a little warning announcement. Of outside that home in the halls with the very latest now. Cole. Robin, this is what we feared when we saw KCSO deputies searching this home yesterday. We now know from search warrants that over the weekend, they found the body of a boy buried in the backyard. They say his yeah. name was Jonathan. But they were probably that still getting discovery checks. is what gave them the ability to search this home yesterday. As you take a look at some of that video from yesterday's search, Warrants say that Michael Anthony Gray Sr. and his wife Shirley Gray lived here along with their son Michael Anthony Gray Jr. You know what I'm having Michael hard Anthony with? Shirley Gray is this shot Sr. right here. And his wife Shirley Gray. See this? Like, I think this is the shed behind the house, and I can't recon reconcile where this tree here is coming from. You know? Um, usually I can be pretty good at that, but. No, oh, that's the other house. Excuse me. Got to flip it around here. It's over here. What's this other thing? What do I got over here? Huh. So there's the shed there. Now it could be one of these, uh, but it, they don't doesn't look the same at all. You know, it does have the rocks going around it, but. And this is from 2014. And that kid, I guess, I mean, he could have been buried back at that time. That's when they lived there. They moved from there in 2016. Uh, it's back there is the shed. Maybe that car wasn't there or whatever. But uh, looking at the angle of these means that the camera's off to the right of it. 
and you can see look at the red roof the window there and then you go to street view here or the 3d version and you can see it right there it's definitely that's it red roof the everything's exactly the same but I don't see where the unless it's like this tree maybe or it's just it's kind of weird I guess it's shot from back here maybe on the street well, actually I can probably tell here in a second let's see Yeah, I mean, maybe it's this tree, and it's just zoomed in, so that looks bigger, and it's back there. where You can't see it because it's right behind this shed. But, you know, it's about like, kind of like that. Well, one more this way. And, but that tree just looks so much bigger, doesn't it? I guess it's just because it maybe it's zoomed way in on it and it's four years later and then back behind there would be that shed so but anyways that is the place apparently the kid was buried in the backyard here Gray lived here along with their son Michael Anthony Gray jr. when searching this home Knox <laughs> what did I say they said roof found <laughs> in the basement like a dog a lock <laughs> room that locks from the outside <laughs> with a dog crate on the inside. The warrant says that one of the boys rescued from the Roan County home told investigators that he was locked here in the basement of this home. Thanks, Miss Gisson. And that Soft, abuse, warm, he deep. says, began here <laughs> back in 26, before 2016. That's when the couple moved to Roan County, where you can see their home in Roan County there on the screen now. They moved to Roan in 2016. Like a dog barking. They're accused of locking a boy in a basement there for Yeah, I think it just depends on where you years. live. They are also accused four of years locked in one that basement. Other doesn't... young children, a girl, a starvation diet of bread and water before she died. They're charged with burying her in the backyard. And today, these search warrants are giving us some idea of why this may have all unfolded. You can see up on your screen, these children are adopted kids for Michael Gray and Shirley Gray. The uh, the search warrants say that the Grays never reported the deaths of those children and continued to receive adoption payments. Anyone on else likes of how Gray aids roof grinning face with smiling eyes. <laughs> roof. Oh, yeah, it was up on the roof. That's how I've always said it. <laughs> I guess it is roof. Dead children, as well as those that remained confined in the basement at their Roan County home. That information coming to us from this Knox County search warrant ser served on this home behind me. As for Michael Anthony Gray Jr. and what he, know, he knew, he told investigators he had no idea there was a body buried in the backyard for years as he lived in this house. But in those search warrants, they say that they believe, investigators believe he knew about that child abuse. And they say he may have even known about the deaths of those two children because he filed taxes with them listed as dependents as late as last year. Yeah, so they were getting the checks for those kids. They were probably like, you know, their medical expenses are too much. We just need to keep this for ourselves. I mean, these, this, these are disgusting people. They are just like the Hart family, right? I, don't, I really don't see any difference whatsoever. The Hart family, I guess the only difference was is they thought they looked like this really cool utopian new age family, you know, adopting six children, all minorities so that they could, and their two white uh, parents to, uh, I guess, what do you call them, lesbian, a lesbian couple. And they adopted them and they would go to things and say, look at us, we, we care so much. And they were just full of shit, okay? They would go home and put those kids, they basically, the Hart family kids, all six of them, they hardly got to eat anything at all. Yet the parents were plump. Man, they, their refrigerator was filled with nice, yummy food. And those kids just stared at it with just starving. And, I mean, the whole thing unraveled when Devante Hart actually went over to the neighbors and started to, uh, you know, ask, hey, can you give us some peanut butter and some bread? Yeah, and for enough for six people. I mean, how cool is that of Devante to be thinking of all the rest of the siblings too at the same time? And then they got caught, you know, but it, it just the whole, the way it went down was horrible. 
Okay, um, you know, CPS shows up out there. Sarah drove home really quick. Jennifer, then they all took off. Then they drove down south. And then eventually Jennifer, you know, all of them took some sort of uh, allergy medicine and made them drowsy. And then they drove off a cliff, killed them all. Just a freaking barbarian. And she did that because she didn't want to get caught. Their, their whole story, they probably thought to themselves, wow, if we don't kill these kids, our entire sort of narrative will be changed forever. But if we kill ourselves, they'll still think we were great parents. It'll just look like an accident. Okay? But the reality is, is the Jennifer and Sarah Hart were... Uh, Jennifer especially was, you know, the worst part of humanity. Just an absolutely disgusting people, just like these two people are right here. Okay, Michael Gray and Shirley Gray are absolute barbarians. And I wish sometimes we lived in a different time where you could just sort of dictate how they got punished. You know? It's just, ah, oh man. Think how horrible it is. These kids, they get adopted. Foster, they were foster kids, I guess, and then adopted. And they just had no chance, man. They never had a chance in life. Because whoever had them before got rid of them. And then they got picked up by absolute barbarians just for the money part of it. Well, that one kid, the one child, the female uh, little girl, she was only fed bread and water. And then she died and was buried in the shed two feet down. And then they realized there was another kid missing, so they drove out to this house right here. And voila! Voila! They find his body buried in the yard at this house. And all the while, they're collecting their $1,600 a month checks. <laughs> God. Man, they, they need to get something where you can take a baseball bat and just go to town. I don't know who does it. But, you know, who, what family member. There, there's no advocates for the kids other than the government and people. You know, there's no family members that probably even know they exist. Hey, thanks, Leah Furness. Why, why are you apologizing for? What happened? I'm sorry. I love you all. Much red heart and respect, Gray. Well, thanks. Um, are you apologizing for respecting me? <laughs> I respect you, too. I don't, I, you know, I don't know what that means, the sorry part. But. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that'd be good, Sarah. <laughs> Cairo's sorry, too. Man, I think there's going to be a lot more is going to come out in this story at the depravity... I mean, three kids lived. So what kind of knowledge do they have? I'm sorry also. Oh, you were? I didn't see you being disrespectful. It's okay, Leah Furness. Yeah, see, like I said, I don't have any ill will. You know? just a show we're just talking about something and what happened to uh, trace elements she said she had the rap recorded and was gonna send it to me I don't see it trace elements capital punishment no what him cyan know what I'm saying yep I know what you're saying
a horrible story, Robin. We're continuing to sift through these details and we'll bring <laughs> you the very latest as we learn them. Incredibly <laughs> disturbing. All right, Cole, thank you. And right now in the WBIR it's app, okay, you can read more about these charges against Michael Gray Sr. and Shirley Gray. Oh, she said she had to call in with the rap? I thought she said she had it recorded. Oh, okay. Well, if you see her pop in here, say, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at. And then I'll have her call in. I'm Canadian, sir. I'm sorry, too. Yeah, insane. Look at these. Look at that. God. You know she was probably the ringleader there, right? Evidence recovered during the investigation this week shows the adoptive children were subjected to abuse while they lived at the Cedar Breeze home, according to records. Evidence suggests Anthony Gray, also known as Bubba, knew it was going on. So this is Anthony Gray right there. One of the Gray children, a 15-year-old boy, told Knox County authorities this week that he been kept in a small room and in a cage in the lower level of the hall's home. Uh, what do you mean the hall's home? Oh, I mean in location, the hall. He told them the other children also had been abused and confined at the hall's home. The children suffered extended periods of malnutrition record state. At some point, he said, Jonathan became sick and disappeared from the house, never to be seen again. The warrant, uh, yeah, because see, here's the thing, is when those parents starve children like that, they, they, uh, they can't go to the doctor because then they're, you know, the, the, the jig is up at that point. So they just kill them and, you know, hey, they disappeared. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy out there, Raven. Crazy. The Gray's 11-year-old adoptive son also described to investigators abuse in the Hall's home. He said Anthony Gray's partner would come downstairs sometimes where the children were confined. Anthony Gray's partner. Well, this is Anthony Gray, so what do, you, what do you mean by partner? Where the children were confined. Yeah, they, Wise is the... Why... Let's see. State. Wise in the affidavit approved this week by Knox County judge said he'd gone into the Cedar Breeze home with Anthony Gray's permission. There he said he found downstairs a large dog crate and a locked room with a peephole and a reverse lock. Oh, man. <laughs> this is just getting worse and worse here. This sounds like just an absolute torture shit show right here. Man. Anthony Gray has denied knowing that the girl or the boy died. He has denied knowing that Jonathan Gray's remains were buried outside according to records. Gray Sr. and his wife never reported the deaths of Sophie or Jonathan. So Sophie's the name of the, the little girl that was murdered, according to the re return warrant. They've continued to receive adoption payments from the state for the dead children, as well as other financial benefits for all adoptive children, record state. So didn't anybody, yeah, I mean, see, the thing is, that's the whole thing. See, if you get to the point where you've adopted the kids and you're in a state that pays out, well, they don't keep checking you anymore. There's no more, you know, when you're a foster parent, there's CPS comes in and checks and sees what's going on, apparently. But in this case, they were adopted, and at that point, they are now the parents. And so they don't come and check anymore. 
And so they just kept getting these payments and payments and payments. Here's what they should do, though. If you adopt children in the states that you get payments, then CPS must visit and inspect all family members every six months. Right? Because you're because you aren't able to take care of the kids by yourself. You're getting money, and therefore you give up the right to just have them and not be checked in by CPS. Don't you think that makes sense? I mean, why? Sh- if you can't afford to have children, then you shouldn't get a nickel. I mean, you if you can't afford it, you shouldn't have children, and you don't get money from the state. <laughs> That's why you're getting kids because you're responsible and you're able to do it. Well, I've, I've said this a thousand times. I'm going back to my roots. Little boy blue. He needed the money. Hey, all right. That's right. I like that. Billy boy blue. And But if you're going to get these huge payouts or any money at all, I mean, I'd say if you, even if you got $100 a month from the state, they come out and they make sure everything's fine because, and that's part of the agreement. And then you'll, you'll actually start getting rid of a lot of these psychos. Because they'll realize, oh, wow, I'll have to actually buy stuff for my kids and feed them because they're going to be checked in on. That's the only way to do it, right? And they won't adopt these kids if there wasn't some financial reward for it. They're all the same that, that do this. The Hart family, this one, a couple of other ones that we've covered. Yeah, you should not be able to adopt kids if you can't afford to take care of them. That's my opinion. But since they do pay out to some who do adopt, then CPS must see all the children and be able to interview them separately on the side every six months. M-U-N-T-S. Okay, anyways, I'm going to move on to the other case that I wanted to talk about. That one uh, is going to make me really angry over time just to keep talking about it. Yep, that's what I just said, William. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. All right, so now we're going to be discussing Jennifer Lynn. Hey, thanks, Dolores. It's a nice comment. This one, this one's just really weird. Um, I think they might actually be on to the right guy, though. But uh, so this is the one we were kind of mentioned a little bit last night. Jennifer Lynn. Jennifer Lynn was an exceptional student, a popular 14-year-old who seemed to stick to the same after-school routine each day before her parents got home from work. She would walk a block from the bus stop past a row of immaculately kept and landscaped houses to her own yellow home in the affluent new uh, Palom- let's see, Palomares Hills development. Usually she would watch television or play with the family dog before starting her homework. But Alameda County Sheriff's investigators are still trying to figure out what happened Friday. The day Lynn's blood-covered body was discovered in an upstairs bathroom. Authorities said she had multiple stab wounds, but they have few clues in the slang that overnight seemed to destroy the sense of security enjoyed by the small hillside community. Solemn-faced neighbors gathered in groups Saturday to talk about the tragedy and mourn the Canyon Middle School 8th grader who was a gifted violinist and a straight-A student. One classmate who lives nearby said Lynn excelled in everything at school and was so well-liked that she always seemed to him the perfect person. I moved here because it's safe, but not now, said Sophia uh, Limnios, whose son had recently played in the orchestra recital with Lynn. She was a friendly, nice girl. We are all upset. 
All right. Let's see, she went home Friday, arriving around 2:30 or 2:45, so she did actually make it home. Obviously. <laughs> I don't even know what you're saying there, Billy Boy Blue. But anyways. She returned home Friday, arriving at 2.30 or 2.45 p.m. She reportedly telephoned a friend at 5.15. So she was chatting away with a friend uh, up around 5.15 or maybe even later and seemed fine to that friend. But when her father, John Lynn, arrived home... Hold on a second. I can't ignore you, Billy Boy Blue. Oh, if Jay Case was a chick. If Jay Case was a chick, <laughs> I would be her husband. Money, money. <laughs> Billy Boy Blue. He needed the money. All right, anyways, here we go. So that was at 5.15. She's talking to a friend. But when her father, John Lynn, arrived home from work at 6.45, he found a gruesome scene upstairs. Nelson said that some of Lynn's clothing appeared to have been forcibly removed. A coroner, a coroner report has not yet revealed if she was sexually assaulted. An autopsy on the cause of death is expected to be completely uh, completed on Sunday. It's really hard to put it together as to what the motive was, Nelson said. He said investigators might request FBI help in putting together a psychological profile of the assailant. Nelson said it was unclear if the attacker got in through an open door or a downstairs window that was broken. The house didn't appear to have been ransacked. Lynn uh, lived alone with her parents, Nelson said. You know, it, it feels to me like it was somebody who knew. I mean, at 5.15, or, you know, 6. The husband gets home at 6, uh, what was it, 6.15? What was that number? 6.45. The, the father, and she's dead, right? So that means between 5.15 and 6.45 is when she was killed. Right during rush hour when people would come home. That's crazy, right? Normally it's in the middle of the night or some, something like that. So it almost feels like the person knew that she was home alone and knew what time her dad would get home. Yeah, and they started looking around behind the house. Now, one thing that I thought was, remember we were looking at this footage? Uh, let me open that up. Right here. It was a, it looked like a plane flying around. And this is where she lived. And I actually looked up the father's name and I found the actual address from 1994. And it was another kind of neat little Google Earth moment i guess you could, you could call it so it's in this neighborhood here but it was right when it first got built so it's right up here so there you go and if we go to let me get to the right case here that should be l-i-n second All right, so you look at this. I actually found the home on the address, but look, it's weird how it, it's the only one with that color roof in a, in a pretty long stretch. There's another one over here, but it's right there. And you can see how it slopes down. They checked all around there. They thought maybe the guy escaped through there. Um, but if you look at this, and then you look at this, you're kind of like, oh, wow, it doesn't look the same at all. But what's neat about Google Earth is it had a 1994 right there. And, man, this is 1993, I mean, July. And almost every, it looks exactly the same. Let me get to the one where it goes back around.
Yeah, we'll just even look at that one, right? So that's over here like this. And see, just those are being built. Now this has these that are being built right now. And just that row, and if you look at Google Earth, that's exactly what's in that shot right there. And then just 2002, it's completely filled in. That's 1993, and then it actually goes back to 1939, but there's nothing there. So there you go. That That's the house right there. So if you go down to Street View... Just right there, isn't that wild? I mean, on, on a street like that, it's interesting that it was there was so few houses at that time. I wonder if that made it, gave him a little bit better chance. I mean, see, there's just a few there, but still, I mean, there's people probably living in all these, you would think, at that time. That was May 29th, May 30th. There she is right there. Autopsy results in the case of a 14-year-old Castro Valley girl shed little light on the motive for her slaying, rec um, according to the Almeida County Sheriff's Department. Although she appeared to have struggled with her killer and had some of her clothes forcibly removed, Jennifer Lynn was not sexually assaulted. They think that she actually fought him off and he got the hell out of there. The girl, a straight-A student in the 8th grade, I mean, after killing her, though, at Canyon Middle School, so the school that she went to is not too far away. It's just right there. And she was a 4.0 student violinist. I mean, really, was, it was only two miles away of the school there. I wonder what it looked back like in 1995, though. That's weird. Now, uh, let's see. Why is it doing that? All right, that's ninety-three. Yeah, so that was just a new development at that time. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they must have used... Yeah, I guess it wouldn't have been satellite, right? That's just what I call it on Google Earth. <laughs> uh, let's see. The girl, a straight-A student in 8th grade at Canyon Middle School and a gifted violinist was found in an upstairs bathroom by her father when he returned from work at 6.45 p.m. Friday, entered the family home in the 7600 block of Pineville Circle. Investigators say Lynn was killed after 5.15 p.m. when she telephoned a friend. A small dining room window on the home's first floor was broken, but police do not know whether an intruder came in that window. A sliding glass door was opened when the father returned home. The girl was stabbed several times in the abdomen. Investigators said the intruder apparently took nothing from the resident. It appears that the motive was to kill her, but why? She's just a cute little sweetheart of a girl, just a nice kid. Deputies have combed the hilly area behind the three-year-old Palomares Hills uh, housing development for clues. Nelson said the killer could have been a burglar who stumbled upon the girl or a drifter who found an open door. Since the house opens into the hills, the assailant could have come into the home and left without being seen. And the investigators are still puzzled the next day. Alameda County officers plan to seek the public's help this week in solving the mysterious and brutal slaying of a popular teenager. Jennifer Lynn died of multiple stab wounds Friday. Her father found his 14-year-old daughter partially clad body in a bathroom at the family's home in a quiet neighborhood known as uh, Palomares Hills. Thanks, Avalon Apples. Look, guys. 
<laughs> oh wait. So you're saying, look guys, did, did that mean she showed up? Oh, there's trace elements. Well, maybe after we do this, you can call up and do your uh, rap, all right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it was a friend. I don't think it was a uh, school, a peer or anything like that. Sheriff deputies remained baffled by a motive. There were no signs of struggle nor apparent sexual assault and nothing was taken from the house. One theory that the attacker as a stranger who took the girl by surprise but investigators said they had no suspects it appears the motive was to kill her but why said sheriff lieutenant ted nelson she's just a cute little sweetheart all also troubling was why the killer removed some of the girl's clothes apparently by force um we'd sure like to know why he did that nelson said it's one of the big issues Deputies continued to question neighbors, and Nelson asked that anyone who saw anything unusual call police. The father who came home from work last week to find his 14-year-old daughter stabbed to death. He had believed his home was a place for love and warmth, but now the shelter is broken. The love is gone. And it only feels cold and scary, John Lynn said Tuesday. Jennifer Lynn, a popular 8th grader, was killed Friday in an upstairs bathroom of her Castro Valley home. And her father found her again at 6.45. Let's see. Move on to the next one here. That's, his, that's her father right there. He's still actively looking at this point. I mean, the investigators were just totally confused. I mean, all it really could be is that the attacker tried to attack, and she fought him off, and then he got nervous and got the hell out of there, but killed her first. But why, why would he kill her, though, if it's somebody that didn't know who she was, right? Oh, you're playing the recording. Okay. <laughs> so they, they actually put together a fifty thousand dollar reward uh back then 1994 that's a lot girl's killer may have been a rapist it says the castro valley girl who was stabbed to death in her home last month may have been the victim of a serial killer bent on sexually assaulting her investigators say Jennifer Lynn, 14, may have been singled out by someone who planned to rape and kill her, said Lieutenant Ted Nelson of the Alameda County Sheriff's Department. Nelson said Wednesday that evidence from the May 27th slaying indicates that this may have been some type of sexual assault that was interrupted. He declined to elaborate. This is all, this is all theory at this point, but we can't rule anything out. We can't afford to put our blinders on, Nelson said. He said the theory was put forward by behavior experts from the FBI who are assisting local investigators. This was a cold and calculated killing, and the fact the crime scene was limited to just the upstairs bathroom where the girl was killed indicates the suspect took pains to keep evidence to a minimum. The girl, a popular student and gifted musician at Canyon Middle School, was nearly nude when found, Nelson said. We think the killer took the clothes off, which supports sexual assault as a possible motive. And if the suspect did this once, he could have done it before, which leads to the possible serial aspect of the case. I mean, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I almost think all rapists and they're all serial i mean who just goes out and especially these kind you know maybe not the ones at a drunken party type thing but the ones that break into a house sexually assault and rape somebody they're they're all serial rapists there isn't any of the one oh well what are you doing today well today i'm thinking of you know that that's what they do okay Yeah.
Yeah. It's crazy. So they got 125 tips that were found in. My classmates remember slain girl. Uh, the 14-year-old Lynn would have been among the top graduates, but was stabbed to death May 27th. Although she was not there to see it, her name was called among the hundreds of graduates. And a friend walked up to the podium to accept her diploma and Golden Apple Principals Award, an honor given to students with six semesters of a 4.0 GPA. Sitting in the front row were her family who videotaped the event, brushing tears away as they watched. So this is a weird thing here. Listen to how crazy this is right here. Are you guys talking to me or? Oh boy. This is kind of an interesting story if you guys would pay attention. Okay? Jesus. Castro Valley Police have released a sketch of a man who accosted the father of murdered 14-year-old Jennifer Lynn in a BART parking lot just two weeks before his daughter was stabbed to death. So isn't that weird? Two weeks before his daughter was stabbed to death, um, he was sort of, you know, accosted by an individual. Lynn's father, John, commissioned artist Gene Boylan to sketch the likeness of a man who approached him as he was nearing his car at the Bay Fair BART station. The man told Lynn that he had a proposition for him and said, I got your daughter. Lynn said he knew Jennifer was at her, but he knew that his daughter was at the viola lesson, so he dismissed the man as a kook and immediately drove off. Two weeks later, on May 27th, Jennifer was murdered. So then they went back in time and thought, wow, so who the hell is this guy? Alameda County Sheriff Lieutenant Ted Nelson said police had not previously released a sketch of the man because a rendition by another artist was not accurate and investigators felt that the incident was bizarre but unrelated to the homicide. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you would know that, but we do not consider this man a suspect in the Jenny Lynn homicide, merely a, sus a subject that we'd like to identify. The case has stumped police and although they continue to follow leads, no suspect or breaks have emerged in the case. The man was described as uh, 30 to 40, 5 feet 8, 8 inches to 5 feet 9, with thick, dark hair and thin build. I, it's hard to tell if that looks like an Asian person or not, but I mean, you, you think you would have put that in the article. Uh, Dad looks for solace solutions and search for the killer. Yeah, I mean, it just just sucks for this guy. Yeah. So here's an article. I think it's was in the paper, but it's been redone for the Internet. So it says, Girl, unsolved murder prompts family to sift for clues. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can say it too, Jenny Penny. Since my wife's Asian, right? I can. What does this have to do with cops right here? What are we talking about? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Oh, you mean the cops dismissing? I know, it's like, really? You're just going to dismiss... An incident that was two weeks before, and the guy seemed like he had knowledge of the family. And uh, on May 27th, John Lynn came home from work and opened the door to a nightmare. And it, this is a 1994 article. I I even looked in the same paper, but couldn't find it. I don't know if the date's wrong or what, or if it was yeah. On May 27th, John Lynn came home from work and opened the door to a nightmare. In an upstairs bathroom lay the broken, bloodied body 
of his 14-year-old daughter. Months later, he is tormented by a single question, why? No one has been able to answer. Whoever murdered Jennifer Lynn left few clues. So Lynn has decided to try to find out why and who for himself. Jenny is too precious, too important for us to just try to hide away from her death. If I don't come out and do something, there's no way I can feel peace in myself. So the family has organized the Friends of Jenny Lynn and set up a toll-free hotline. They have held a candlelight vigil and fundraising dance. Uh, let's see, deck trees and lapels with ribbons of royal blue, Jenny's favorite color, and distributed thousands of flyers seeking information. It is un, it's an unusual step, but one that victim advocates say more families are taking, spurred by the need for solution and to some degree solace. They've got to have some meaning. They cannot deal with their child dying in vain. Yeah, I can just say that even for my brother, like my mom switched all the way to anti-drug adv advocacy, you know, just, yeah, she was basically an anti drug warrior i mean she would go all go to washington and she did that for she still does it i mean we're talking 1986 she was big time all the way up to like 2000 really like one of the you know pioneer you know i don't know not pioneers not the right one but the uh <clears throat> she just really kicked ass so i was always so proud of her still am she still does it but So if you're one of the people that goes, oh, I think all drugs should be, you know, let people do what they want. I, I don't care, okay? I don't care what your opinion is on it. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm just saying it, it was it's a very noble cause, okay? It's not like she was pushing drugs or something. The concept of families declaring... Okay, so that's it. He now hosts the popular television program... Yeah, so here's the thing. is in this article... Adam Walsh and there's even and Polly Class's dad. They're even in this article. The concept of families declaring a personal war on crime is not new. Adam Walsh, uh, Adam Walsh's father John, became a crusader for victims' rights after his six-year-old son was abducted and killed in 1981. He's, he now hosts the popular television program, America's Most Wanted, which publicizes crimes to help police capture the criminals. But the phenomenon drew new attention last year when hundreds of volunteers poured time and money into a massive effort to find another kidnapped child, 12-year-old Polly Class of Petaluma. The search ended with the discovery of Polly's body last December, but a foundation named after her continues to serve as an advocacy group offering advice to other victims, families, including the Lynn's. I think it is very, and it, you know what's kind of neat is that's kind of what Kyron Horman Foundation is doing as well. Because you, if you notice, we donate to the Kyron Horman Foundation for the Allison Watterson case. I think it's very important for victims' families to get involved. Uh, let's see. Down here it starts getting into the details again. Let's see. Everyone is, is hugging everybody. Not surprising. Investigators say they believe whoever killed the teenager broke in through a small window downstairs. <clears throat> they also believe the killer acted alone, was familiar with the neighborhood, and the family scheduled and had targeted, and let's see, and the family schedule. Oh yeah, there you go, that's what I was thinking. Was familiar with the neighborhood and the family schedule and had targeted the girl. Right, because it's the time frame is so ludicrous, right during rush hour when everybody gets home. So he knew that the father wasn't going to be home till 6.45, and he had that window. I'm not sure where the mom is at that time. The wounds indicate that it was very deliberate, very careful, very controlled. 
See, isn't that crazy? This is getting a little bit more specific here in these articles. The wounds indicate that it was a very deliberate, very careful, very controlled attack. One puzzling incident is an encounter John Lynn had at a commuter train station a few weeks before the killing. An unkempt man approached him and said something like, I have a deal for you. We have your daughter, Nelson said. Lynn avoided the man and drove away. He got home to find both his daughters safe and thought little more about the incident until the murder. Nelson said he doubts the man had anything to do with the case, but I mean, why though? I mean, yeah, but the volunteer group commissioned and has circulated a sketch, and they still have that sketch on their page now. What Nelson would like to learn more about is a report of a man seen walking away from the Lynn neighborhood carrying a blue sports bag with red straps and heading towards an athletic field. There was no activity planned that night on the field. Nelson conceded that Cole, that, I mean, that could mean anything. Perhaps the witness was confused about the night he saw the stranger. He'd like to know for sure. I think it's the other one's way more interesting that the guy that came up to the father. Meanwhile, Nelson says he has no plans to give up on the investigation. Someone out there must know something about this, he said. Okay, now we're, that was 1994, now we're moving all the way up to 2006 here. Alameda County Jenny Lynn killing suspect named after 12 years. Convict serving life in Oregon. Oh my God, I live in Oregon, that means I know everything about it. Oh, I've never heard of this yet. Uh, convict serving life in Oregon has been focus of long probe. So that's her right there again. Nearly 12 years to the day after a 14-year-old girl was stabbed to death in her Castro Valley home, Alameda County authorities on Wednesday said a convicted murderer serving three life sentences in Oregon is the prime suspect in a 1994 killing. The announcement marked the first time detectives have publicly identified a suspect in the killing of Jenny Lynn but authorities said Sebastian Alexander Shaw has been the focus of their investigation since his arrest in Oregon shortly after Jenny was killed. Shaw has been a person of interest in the case for a very long time, said Alameda County Sheriff Commander Greg Ahern. Because of the convictions in Oregon and the trial, we didn't want to interfere with that investigation or interfere with the trial. Shaw was convicted of a third killing earlier this month in Multnomah County, Oregon, clearing the way for Alameda County investigators to proceed with the case. Word that authorities had identified the man they believed killed their daughter brought a measure of relief to Jenny's parents, John and Mai Leon Lin, who hold a candlelight vigil for her each year on the Friday before Memorial Day. Over the years, Friends and relatives have erected billboards publicizing the case and held car washes and concerts in tribute to the gifted violinist. Yeah, I'm going to go to this next. So I'm going to go right over to, I have a folder on Sebastian Shaw. So look, look at these. These are murders. At this time, he hadn't been arrested yet, though. These were ones that he was associated with. So check these out. A Portland man found stabbed to death in his apartment was a disciple of New Age religions who often invited virtual strangers into his home to chat. J.A. Reichbeel, 40, bled to death from a cutting wound to the neck. Deputy State Medical Examiner Dr. Karen Gunson said Wednesday his body was found about 5.30 p.m. Tuesday by his roommate and the apartment manager. Neighbors told police that Rick, uh, Rick Beale, a paraplegic who lived on Social Security disability payments, had a constant stream of visitors and often gave money to them, Detective Sergeant Larry Neville said. Vera White, a neighbor for five years, and Rick Beale was a believer in New Age philosophies who often 
would try to convert strangers. He'd give them cards with his name and address and invite them over. Rick Beal was perhaps too trusting, White said. He often complained of people who came over and then stole things. Apartment manager Mac McCarty, McCartney said Rick Beal's roommate came to him Tuesday evening after he was unable to unlock his door. The two men got the door open and found the body. And he said he was a good tenant, always eager to talk. Now here's something I thought was just kind of interesting as I put his name into newspapers.com and this is a 1957 article of him. He's right here. Son of Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Rick Beale, Klamath Fall, seated in receiving instruction in recognizing shapes at the Children's Hospital School, Eugene from uh, Eugene from Barbara Palmeter, a volunteer, Jay is making rapid progress at the school, which is financed partly through the Easter Seal. I think he had like cerebral palsy. Okay, so I mean, it's crazy that he was actually he was in the paper quite a bit back then. It was weird. So that was 1991 where he was killed. And then here's the another incident, and these are all attributed to Sebastian Shaw, who actually has a, an, act, an Asian name. I think he's from Vietnam. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, a man and a woman died in their trailer of stab wounds to the throat. See, again, we got stab wounds to the throat again. A medical examiner said Tuesday. Todd A. Rudiger, Todd, oh, that's his name, Todd A. Rudiger. I think it's not the same name as the guy on, uh, like, Rudy. Todd A. Rudiger, 29, and his live-in girlfriend, Donna G. Ferguson, 18, were found by their father's Monday evening in the bedroom of the trailer home, said Sergeant Derek Foxworth, a spokesman for the police bureau. Both Ferguson and Rudiger were stabbed in the neck and bled to death, said Dr. Larry Lumen. Foxworth said Ferguson had been found with her hands bound behind her back and Rudiger was lying face down. The father went looking for the Southeast Portland couple Monday after they hadn't heard from the pair for several days. Okay, about 30 members of support group called Parents of Murdered Children gathered in Northeast Portland, home to talk, prepare for their national conference, and welcome a new member. Deborah Adams, 18-year-old daughter, Donna Ferguson, was found stabbed to death July 20th in Southeast Portland. Ferguson's fiance, Todd Rudiger, was found murdered alongside her. Adams, still days from the murder, joined the group at the recent meeting she told of her struggle to overcome grief and find counseling for Adam's four-year-old son. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just... Now, check this out, though. And that was 1992, and then in 1998, man indicted in 1992 case. Nearly six years after slaying of a couple in a mobile home, a man was formally charged Monday with the murder in the stabbing death and stabbing death, and with raping the woman during the attack. So he, he ended up raping the female, but killed the guy. Uh, the murder and rape charges against 30-year-old Sebastian Alexander Shaw were based on new physical evidence that police refused to elaborate on. Shaw was also charged with a 1995 rape in which the victim was bound and beaten. We're hoping it will bring a couple of people out of the woodwork who may have been victimized by him, said police spokesman Cliff Madison. Madison said the arrests have helped bring closure for the families of Todd A. Rudiger, 27, and his girlfriend Donna G. Ferguson, 18, who were stabbed to death in their southeast Portland mobile home in July 1992. Their bodies were not discovered until three days later. Police say Ferguson was sexually assaulted during the attack. Shaw, who was arrested February 20th, was also charged with a 1995 rape. Okay. 
And serial killer Shaw spared death row. So he's a serial killer at this point. So that FBI profile was pretty accurate if this guy is the one who killed Jennifer Lynn. Uh, a Multnomah County. Hey, thanks, Curious Georgia. And thanks, Darrell Greggs. Yep, George Floyd. Yeah, we talked about him earlier. So let me, okay, a Multnomah County jury decided not to send a man already serving time for two murders to death row for a third. That of a paralegic man. So that's the death of uh, uh, J. Rickbeal. George Floyd. You guys finding this one interesting? I think it is. And there's uh, articles coming up that show why they were interested in this particular guy. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for the coverage on all cases. Well, no problem. All right. So he didn't get the death penalty there. A prosecutor said Shaw attacked Rick Beal after getting fired from a job at Paragon Cable. He took his... I remember that. Jeez, that's funny. He took his rage out on Rick Beal slashing the man's throat while he lay in bed, prosecutors say. Shaw was arrested after police waiting outside a Portland supermarket, retrieved a cigarette he discarded to get a DNA sample. Wow. So they were doing that back in... Uh, what year did, it, did this happen? Hmm. So it must have been a lot later. Shaw is serving two life sentences for the 1992 murders of a Portland man and a woman. Their throats were slashed and the woman was raped. He is also in prison. Yeah, so they're repeating that again. Okay, so now I'm going to go back out to the main folder. That was just the aside on Sebastian Shaw's other killings. But I, was, I wanted you to see how the articles were when they weren't even mentioning him because they weren't solved for all those years. It was, took six years to get him arrested. From our family to yours, we want to encourage you to keep going, keep being fearless, and most of all... So this is a, a May 25th, 2019 article. Keep being here when you need us. It's been 25 years since an East Bay teenager was murdered in her own home. But this horrific crime remains unsolved. Friends and family hope new advances in DNA technology will finally bring a killer to justice. ABC 7 News reporter Cornell Bernard has the latest. They lit candles and walked together through the streets of Castro Valley to remember Jenny Lynn, murdered 25 years ago. Friends and family honored her at a memorial service. Jenny Lynn was only 14 when she was murdered by a stranger who broke into her Castro Valley home in 1994. The pain felt like yesterday. Jenny's parents, May Leanne and John, never imagined her murder would go unsolved. When my daughter was killed 25 years ago, I thought this case would have been solved like in two weeks. But DNA technology, the same science which brought the notorious yeah. Golden State... By the way, this guy right here, what a clown this guy was. Yeah, when they, when they arrested him, he was in there cooking burgers, you know, yeah, having a grand old time, and all of a sudden he turns into a guy that looks like he's, you know... <laughs> I was going to make a, a political joke, but anyways, he... <laughs> he looks like he's been in a... Uh, a facility for a long time, okay? Killer to justice last year could give old evidence new life. We're looking at mitochondrial DNA. We're looking at the possibility of extracting DNA from items we have in evidence and running Ooh. through new procedures. So hair, you Considering found hair fiber. technology about yeah. DNA, you know, it could be tomorrow that uh, we got a hit. 
The Jenny Lynn Foundation now promotes child safety and music. Jenny was a gifted musician. The foundation holds summer music camps and gives scholarships. But John Lynn's real dream is one he promised his daughter. I made a promise at my daughter's graveside that we would never give up finding the killer for her, for no matter how long it would take. A $100,000 reward is still being offered for an arrest and conviction in the case. Jenny Lynn would have been 39 this weekend. In Castro Valley, Cornell Bernard, ABC 7 News. We believe we're touched by the suspect at the scene. Uh, we believe could possibly have DNA on uh, the techniques going. we used Keep when DNA first came out in the late 90s uh, have been advanced. And so we believe that maybe the particles that we could recover through like a vacuum uh, process may be able to lead us to the identity of the suspect. There's another new technology that we're looking at which will separate the DNA uh, where it's been mixed. And prior to uh, this investigation, that technology wasn't available to us. It did not exist. Yes, yeah, so this, this is May 27th. So this, this article was two days ago. Now it's possible that we can take a mixture of the DNA of the suspect and the victim, separate those two, and go through technology to determine uh, the identity of the suspect. Uh, the investigators that really have devoted their life behind this are still in hopes that we'll be able to resolve this case. Then we created a website so people could go back and look into Castro Valley and the crime scene and maybe refresh their minds of what happened on that day 26 years ago because Castro Valley has changed. And so maybe they want to take a look at that website and take a look to see if they have one clue that would lead us to the potential. Hey Ada, what you, what's that big rip-roaring laugh emoji you got on there? The suspect. Well, anytime you have a young child that is murdered in such a way that, that Jenny was found, it tears at your heart. Uh, it's very emotional. Uh, we all have children. We all have family members. We all have people that it brings it too close to home. But that could have been your child. Oh. It could have been uh, your niece. It could have been uh, your, your friend. And all of that uh, really tears at you. And to know that somebody uh, has not been apprehended after 26 years because of this crime makes it even more of a challenge for us. But it also gives us hope that we're going to pursue that individual until we do find justice for the Lynn family. Yep, and there's that. And this this is I gotta use. It's weird how I have to use Firefox because. Man, uh, my, uh... As more California industries look to get back to work um, after the coronavirus really pandemic, a Bay Area economics professor says do not expect a pre-COVID economy. Yeah, so this is a website that they put up, and then there's this is a video here that shows her, uh... Yeah. It's pretty sad. And, that's her only kid at the, well, the only one living at home at the time. She has an older, a couple older siblings. Well, they might already have caught the guy. That's the thing. I didn't blow it. No, you blew it and then we cracked it. And it broke. Here are a lot of the White House in Washington, D.C. White House. Oh, White House. And that was just right before she was murdered, too. Doing nothing in particular except So she had great parents, too, you know, taking them around, taking her around. <laughs> 
<laughs> she probably be working for, uh, well, I hate to say it, but Lynn, CNN. Lynn, Lynn, live from right next to me. Can you go shoot her? That was fun. Oh, here I am live uh, with behind me some cherry trees that are very pretty. It's a cherry tree, cherry blossom. Like cherry blossom. Across from the Washington Monument. I mean, it's just, think how horrible and it is. It's very nice. She was so, just a cute, smart girl, and then some <laughs> barbarian goes into her house and right in the okay. middle of the evening. how happy the dad is right there. They took her to Washington. Probably just those three. I mean, she was killed just six weeks after this, these videos. It's April 6th, too. When? April 7th. Hey, Lincoln Memorial there. Oh wow. That's May 14th. 1994. Oh, that's May 20th. I think she and she's actually uh she was murdered just seven days after this right here. That's crazy to have all that footage like that. She was so good at the violin, she played for the high school, not the grade school she was in. Did you forget your own when you was for Japan? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. It's my pleasure. Oh, wow. That was two days. How cute. That was May 25th. Oh, that's crazy. Hold up the troll. This is Jenny, the 14th year's birthday, huh? Why'd you time out Jenny Penny? Curious Georgia? Jesus, what, what are you doing? God. <laughs> hey, Jenny uh, Penny, Curious Georgia accidentally blocked, uh, not blocked you, but put you on timeout for five minutes. We were watching that one time. Yeah. Don't you have some of these? Yeah, yeah. I have the first two. Is that an interesting book? I started reading one of them. Mm -hmm. Those are, that's all five of them. Uh, is that an interesting... You can't undo that. She has to wait five is minutes. Is that an interesting reading? Yeah. Do you think I can read it? And now all of her Does comments from the whole show are gone. Briefcase? Toilet room. <laughs> yeah. You didn't read the inside. But we remember they were all great comments. I guess there's, what's this part here? I don't think I was just part of the end of the video. I don't know if that. All right. Don't you have some of these? Anyways, that's what they got on there. Is that an interesting book? Isn't that wild that that's just two days before? That's probably even in their, their house. And they try to put some stuff in here, but it's really not that useful. Uh, like, you know, they have this little thing that you can click around. I, I guess maybe this is the bathroom. That is the bathroom on the second floor, so I guess that's somewhat useful there. But like, there's, you can't click on all the spots. I mean, so the person had to go up the stairs. That's her bedroom right there. Should have got me to make these. And she's still on the FBI page here. On May 27th, 1994, that was just two days after that video we just saw, 14-year-old Jennifer Lynn, also known as Jenny Lynn, was brutally murdered in her home in Castro Valley, California after returning from school. The FBI and the Alameda County Sheriff's Office in California are seeking information from the public to help solve the murder. Now, the thing about that Sebastian guy, I mean, he, he's an Asian guy. His name is Chow, uh, probably like Kwang Ho, right? So, but he calls himself Sebastian Alexander Shaw. So he, he's Asian there. I don't know if he was ever really skinny like the drawing, so maybe he wasn't related to... The guy that was two weeks before that he met the dad and said, oh, I've got your kid. Maybe, you know, maybe he wasn't related to that. And maybe him being Asian made it so people weren't that concerned going into a house, an Asian house or something. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that played a role in it at all. But down here, um, it says, right, out-of-state man placed in Castro Valley area at the time of the murder. So here's the thing. This is why they think that this guy might have something to do with it. Uh, nearly 12 years to the day after she was murdered, police say they have placed a suspect in Oregon in the Bay Area at the time 14-year-old Jenny Lynn Castro Valley was killed. Authorities confirm convicted kill 
uh, serial killer, basically. Sebastian Shaw, 38, has been named as the suspect. Shaw is serving time for three murders, including the death of a paraplegic man. The Alameda County Sheriff confirms that Shaw is the prime suspect in the case. So they probably just need to extract the DNA and see if it's a match. Now, if it's not a match, you know, and, and that does happen all the time when they do this DNA stuff, it'll be, it'll be crazy because they focus on the wrong guy the whole time, but this guy does seem like a pretty good suspect. I mean, he, he stabbed and killed another woman and raped her when she was 18, right? And he's a violent guy, and he was in the area at the time. Shaw reportedly confessed to a number of crimes in exchange for avoiding death penalty during his recent murder trial. Earlier this month, a Multnomah County jury decided not to recommend the death penalty for Shaw in the murder of 40-year-old Jay Rickbeal. Sheriff Deputy Greg Ahern told CBS 5 that they have been able to link Shaw to the East Bay at the same time the young girl was killed. It's going to take them time to come up with a plan, a strategy, and direction for us on how they would like us to proceed. Lynn's death shocked the, even the police who threw all their resources at finding Jenny's killer. The FBI was called in and drew up a profile of the killer. Leads were chased down. It didn't take long after 14-year-old Jenny Lynn was killed in 1994 for Alameda County officials to start investigating whether Sebastian... See, this is like pretty quickly after she was murdered. They started investigating whether Sebastian Alexander Shaw had anything to do with it. But it would take years before they knew enough to make him their prime suspect. As the investigation into Castro Valley Girls killing began, Shaw was one of more than 50 people authorities looked at, but it wasn't until 1998 when Shaw was linked to two killings and a rape in Portland, Oregon, that he began. they began a major focus in Alameda County. Only in the past year has he became the prime suspect in May 27, 1994, killing of Alameda County Sheriff Department. Uh, oh, hey, thanks, Timothy Cecil. Let's see, Shaw. There was something about him stealing a car and leaving the area three days after the murder. I don't know where that is, though. Let me see. Damn. I like these cold cases, okay, hand medium skin tone. Yeah, I like covering them too. It's good stuff. Investigators have long believed that Jenny's killer had little or no previous contact with her, and Shaw told police and jailers in prison interviews that he is responsible for 10 to 12 more killings. Wow. Every, wow, that's crazy. He said he would confess if he would... We guaranteed he wouldn't face the death penalty. Yeah, why not? <laughs> See, that's the thing, is I think they should make these deals with people. They just have to prove it. You know, that's, it's unfortunate... But serial killers have a lot of chips. You know, they can say, hey, you know, if you give me this, I'll tell you about the... They're still going to be in prison for the rest of their life. So I think they should just cut deals with them. Because then it gives some sort of, uh, you know, answers to family members. Uh, Portland police arrested Shaw, now 38... Uh, in, let's see, 4.35 a.m. on August 31st, 1994, after finding him asleep in a green 1978 Pontiac Bonville stolen during a burglary at a home in on Broadmoor Drive in San Ramon. So let's see where that is. 
Yeah, that's right. This is what I was looking for. Oh man, that's not far away at all. Jesus. <laughs> I would not be surprised at all if this is the killer. Look at that. Jesus. That's probably what? Four, five miles? Thanks, maybe? Gray. Good night. Will Cat replay smiling face with smiling eyes? Good night, Linda Howell, as in Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilation. Look at that, 4.47 miles is where he stole that car from. You don't think that's a little interesting? I mean, if you zoom out, look how close that is in all of California. And then it's just right there, four miles away from the home right there. So this is the main part right here. So he was arrested on on uh, at um, on uh, what is it August thirty first, nineteen ninety four, after finding him asleep in a green nineteen seventy eight Pontiac Bonneville stolen during a burglary at a home. So that means he has the ability to break into houses, right? You know, I guess maybe he broke into the house not thinking she was going to be there because there was no cars out front. And then his motive changed, and things just went haywire, and he killed her, too, and then he took off, right? Because if he's a burglar as well, I mean, I guess that's a possibility. He didn't know anybody was home. Police found a handgun in the front seat and two rifles in the trunk. San Ramon Police Sergeant Brian uh, Kalinowski said the burglary occurred while the occupants were vacationing, listen to this, between May 30th and June 7th. So look at that. Between May 30th and June 7th, literally a 10-day window after she was murdered, he's stealing a car right there. And look at that. The police looked this direction. Oh, yeah, I read another article that the dogs tracked the scent this direction down this mountain right here and look where that leads right over to where the car was stolen I find that like too interesting I if they come back with DNA and it's not him I'd be shocked That's unreal. So that's why I had to tie it back to this. I had to go back to these articles. Portland police said Shaw had pornography and a murder kit that included a ski mask, surgical gloves, duct tape, knives, binoculars, and plastic handcuffs used by police. But they released him after Contra Costa County officials declined to extradite him for a car theft and local prosecution. See, look how weak sometimes the decisions are that uh, law enforcement make. Just things like that. Well, you found a kill kit, but, you know, the car, you know, it's just, it's ludicrous, okay? Maybe you should have charged him with that to then investigate why he had that kill kit. Portland police said Shaw had pornography and a murder kit. Jeez. Uh, Portland police arrested Shaw again in 1998 after DNA obtained from a discarded cigarette butt linked him to the July 1992 killing, which was two years prior to Jennifer being murdered, of Donna Ferguson. So... Look at it like this, everybody. In two years before Jennifer was murdered, he murdered another female that was 18 years old in Oregon and raped her. Then he's all the way up in California within four or five miles of the actual home that she was murdered in. And the dogs even sent it out this direction. And he's got a, a, a murder kit in that vehicle. 
Man, there's got to be a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> see, that, that seems like a really good possibility. Now, like we always say, it might not be at all, but it sounds pretty good. Now, whatever it involves. I, I don't know. It's just the whole legal system is what I'm referring to, Dojo. Okay. Um, I think it was pretty obvious. Let's see. Uh, like, I, the thing is, district attorneys, law enforcement, they're all on the same team. Just like, you know, I mean, that's what sort of the disadvantage to anybody that's at, on trial is that the district attorney and the police are definitely on the same team. They always get their stories straight. They come up with uh, the, the theory that they're going to do, and they want to make sure that the testimony matches what the, the theory is going to be. And then the judge almost always is biased towards the prosecution. And that's why it takes a great attorney to convince the jury that, you know, you, you kind of start off in, as in a weak position when you're in court in a in um, serious criminal cases I don't know she's not able to come back Jenny Penny I don't know did Jenny Penny disappear or what I don't know why, why are you asking me that though How do you know she's even still here? Maybe she took on. Oh, she can't chat? Ah, good job, Curious Georgia. Yeah, the problem is that YouTube's having problems lately. All right, try to try to say something now, Jenny Penny. Try it again. So now. Yeah, there's not much more you can do, but you know, it's like <laughs> I don't know how that even happens so often. It's just strange. Well, have her, like, refresh or something. Like, have her, um, I don't know if she's on her phone, but have her get go out of YouTube and then come back on. Well, I tried making her a moderator to see if that would make her able to comment, but <laughs> I guess I guess she can't. Okay, let me try this. I'll hide. No, I don't want to hide her. I'm not going to do that. Hmm. Weird. Let me see if I refresh on my end if it makes a difference. I don't know. No, it is a big deal. <laughs> you know, what if the next show she can't comment? Like, she's permanently... Like, I can't comment on... There's certain channels I go to, and I'm not blocked by them or anything, and they can't see me, ever. So I don't want that to be the situation. What you could do is create a separate Gmail account that's very similar and come right back on or something like that. Oh, well, it bugs me, you know. No, I'm just saying why, I don't know why it always happens. Like, people end up blocking people all the time. Have her try to, like, refresh her phone or, you know, like, turn off, get out of YouTube, and then come back in or something. Anyways, I think it... I think it looks pretty promising that that guy could actually be the the killer. Don't you think? Oh, have a reboot. 
I'm on my computer too. <laughs> Let me check to make sure she's not blocked somehow. I don't think she is, but I always feel bad when that happens. Be just a minute here. We're gonna have like thousands of people blocked. It's great. Nope, I, I even looked in the area. She's a, uh, I made her a moderator to see if uh, that would work, but that's all I have her set up as. Hey, look at this, cool, I've lost probably eight subs tonight. You know, since I started, when I brought up the other case, even though I said exactly the truth of it, the reality of it, in the other case, people go, oh, he's not just saying exactly what I wanna believe. So I gotta leave his channel. Oh. Idiots. Keep on going, everybody. Listen, if you don't like what I'm saying and you're that shallow, get the hell out of here. Idiots. My God. Unbelievable. So I guess she wasn't able to get back in. Well, tell her at the last result uh, resort, she'd have to uh, create another Gmail account and call herself Jenny Pennies, <laughs> and then come back in again, and you know, however that works. Except if you become a channel member again, you'll lose your. You're still on the first one, anyways, though. Probably right. You guys are. Does anybody have the new one yet? I don't think anybody's... We're, we've been doing this long enough. Yeah. Anyways, I think that uh, that's all I got for you guys. I thought that was an interesting case. Really, really sad, too. Um, hopefully that is the guy because that means he's been off the streets for a long time. He's already been in prison for 22 years. So if that is him, that'd be great. But it'd be great to prove it with DNA. And if it's not him, then hell, get the other the guy off the streets. Right? Now, what I was saying earlier regarding Floyd is that I, I read the document for you guys that it actually says that he, while he was standing up, he had a hard time breathing. The autopsy shows that there was no damage or anything to his airways or anything like that and that he had health issues, uh, cardiac health issues and coronary artery disease. I mean, it was like a lot of stuff going on there. And that might have been what ended up killing him. But the police didn't do a damn thing to, to help. Even when he had no pulse, that one officer kept his knee on the neck of him for three minutes. I mean, wh what are you doing? He's, he doesn't have a pulse. He's not going to get up and start jumping around. You have him cuffed, you idiot. 
Okay, so that guy, he seemed like he intentionally had malicious thoughts in his mind about not letting that guy ever get up again. Okay? Killing him. So, I think his charge should be pretty high. Uh, it, it, it's a little different than it would have been had the knee actually been what killed him. But it's not a ton different for me because he had no regard for the life of Floyd. Okay? Zero. He just didn't give a shit whatsoever. So, when you, when you think of it like that, he definitely has a high, you know, I, I don't know which charge you'd give him at this point, but they, they charge him with, with charges they think they have on him, regardless if the knee didn't kill him. Because, see, when the prosecutor made these um, recommendations, he had that information saying that, you know, maybe the knee isn't what killed him. There are There is going to be more autopsy, you know, the final autopsy is going to come out. So maybe that'll change things. But at this point, that's what his preliminary findings were. Uh, it was exactly what I just told you. And I don't know why it makes people angry when you tell them that. <laughs> it's just, it's bizarre. You know, you, you get a document this one right here, and it says right here, the Hennepin County Medical Examiner conducted Mr. Floyd's autopsy on May 26. The full report of the ME is pending, but the ME has made the following preliminary findings. The autopsy revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. Mr. Floyd had underlying health conditions including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease. The combined effects of Mr. Floyd being restrained by the police, his underlying health conditions, and any potential intoxicants in his system likely contributed to his death. So this word here, potential, means you know, if they find any, but they don't, obviously, the preliminary autopsy probably didn't have the results yet. So I, I wouldn't even have put that into the sentence at that point. I would have just said his underlying health conditions uh, likely contributed to his death, okay? You didn't need to put po potential. That's just like total speculation there, right? Like, why would you say hey, potential intoxicate? Well, <laughs> When you when you know for sure, let us know. But uh... huh? I don't get it, Rebecca. Yeah, all I'm saying is, when the guy was on the ground, Floyd, they te they checked his pulse. He didn't have one that one time because after he looked like he just passed out, and. They did nothing. Now, I, I guess it's possible that he could have had his knee on his neck there and it, it caused the blood flow to stop, but not cause any damage where you can detect something like that, right? So I guess we'll have to wait and see on that too. So it could have been that the knee created blood flow issues, but it just didn't cause any physical damage to his neck, right? So I guess they're going to still have to figure out what was the actual cause of death. Was it lack of blood flow? Was it some sort of a cardiac event? That kind of thing. Yeah, well, maybe there wouldn't be any bruising, though. You know? It's hard to say. Anyways, I think that's it, man. I'm I'm all tired. I'm tired now. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, hopefully Jenny Penny can come back tomorrow. I like having Jenny Penny in here chatting. She's funny. She's got that cute little dog, too, with the tongue that sticks out on the side. Yeah, so if she's up, make her, uh, have her sign up on another account or something. Yeah, Jeannie. Well, I, I don't remember. I'm not going to remember the name. It's too hard. I got too many names to remember. I don't even know if it's Jeannie or Jean or what it is, but. Yeah, I don't know. I've tried rebooting and I never can get on to other people. I don't know what happened. It's like YouTube didn't remember to untime somebody out. Let's see. In this video, so how do you keep somebody from? Oh, you have to block. Nobody got blocked. So. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really know how to fix something like that. Sorry about that. But uh, here we go. We're going to go ahead and go back to the happy fly space. Okay, Jean. All right. Jean. I had a sister named Jean. Like Jean Fish. Or I have a sister. <laughs> I just don't see her very much. So. Uh, stepsister. Yeah, that's what I said. Had. And then I explain why I said that. Yeah, jeez. Everybody likes to repeat everything I say. Let me, where's the, uh, I gotta get some music. Like I could say, gosh, man, that looks like the Galapagos Islands, Galapagos Islands. And then somebody would say, Galapagos, they'd type in. I know, I said that. Did you hear that? I just said that. Yeah, I'll, I'm. I'm gonna. I never said I was not gonna keep, keep doing it, Richard. I'm just tired tonight. You know, it's been a long day. Yeah, I think we already did. We've done Yo Sim. Well, I guess I've been done this a thousand times. But. Thanks, Dadio Caspian Horses Rock. Let's see, you're, you wanna you wanna come here? Oh man. Cool. What do you do, Bauer? Oh, wait. Hold on. Before I do that, though. Thank you, Claudia Dubauer. Thank you to Kit Kat, Patricia M., Chrissy Paradis, Miss Skiss, Sarita Hilly, Caroline, <coughs> Carolina T., Sarah Brown, Cherry, or Cherie, or Sherry, or <laughs> Avalon Apples, Jay Case, David Myers, Charlene S., Cairo, Zozo, Rachel Rose, Julie J., Curious Georgia, Miss Skiss, Soft Warm Deep, Leah Fernas, Cairo, Julie J., Babs Bunny, 
Billy Boy Blue and Billy Boy Blue again. Avalon Apples and Curious Georgia. And Darrell Greggs, Timothy Cecil, Linda Howell, Dottie O'Casby Norse's Rock, Claudia Neubauer, and Nan Sullivan right at the end there. Thank you. And Claudia Neubauer lurking. Nan Sullivan. See, look at right there. Doesn't have the 3D model on it. <laughs> Look at that! Body O Castillo's the rockets moving with the music. Winking face. Georgia, don't create the drama. Don't be so don't be cared about it. You're not gonna beg for me to remove it? What are you talking about? You're crazy. Jesus. Anyways, that is it for me. Long night, long night, long night. So, uh, <laughs> so tired. It's weird. Just emotionally drained. Right, well, don't cause drama because you feel bad that you can't fix it. None of us can fix it, right? I don't know how to fix it either. Okay, everybody, thank you all for showing up tonight. Uh, make sure you keep washing your hands. Uh, wear the masks. Uh, you know, don't do the rioting thing where everybody's not wearing masks, standing right next to each other. Total idiots, okay? Uh, so just make sure that you're all safe out there, right, everybody? So thank you all for showing up tonight. Thanks, Randy Warhol, for, for Jenny Penny's bail. Well... Hopefully tomorrow it works, but if if all fails, just have her create another Gmail account. You know, it's pretty easy. So. For Jenny Penny's bail. Wow, that sounded like a robot. All right, everybody, thank you for showing up tonight. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, 
be safe out there. <laughs> be safe out there. <laughs> Two, three, four. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, flag rejecter. I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like Ooh. an old projector. Ooh, crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector. And I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor. Than a spanking with, with a vector on his pector with all respect, y'all. Just remember, I've a temple fucking check, ya. I have no agenda, I'm no pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody, talk to you. Hello, Mary Lou. Where are you, Mary Lou? I'm right here, but I thought you could say goodnight first, because you never do. I always have to say goodnight first. I know, but that's just the way it works, okay? You're the one that says, goodnight, John Boy, and then I say goodnight, Mary Lou. Well, no, it doesn't work like that anymore. Now I say goodnight, and then you have a couple crazy comments to make, and then I get angry, you get angry, everybody gets angry. <laughs> okay, wow, uh, Mary Lou. Goodnight, Mary Lou. Good night, John boy. Gosh, you don't have to be a brat about it. Well, I wasn't being a brat about it. Yes, you were. Oh, you're being mean again. Good night, John boy. Good night, Mary Lou.